Welcome. Thank you all for joining us at ThinkTech Hawaii. Time for responsible change. <clears throat> and we're fortunate to have with us retired Judge Sandra Sims, also author, working on your second book now, right? Hopefully. <laughs> I'm working on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm really, really working on it. <laughs> the, the stories are unfolding. Yes. And speaking of stories, a man who brings so many of them to the table, Ben Davis, a retired professor from the University of Toledo School of Law, also recently University of Illinois at Chicago School of Law, and now at Washington Lee School of Law, coming to us from Charlottesville, Virginia. Howdy. Well, Ben, Sandra, we have a, a momentous day. Indeed, we do. Indeed, we do. Judge, now justice. Jackson has been confirmed. So I would just like to say something. Say it. Go for it. All right. My mother used to tell me that she slept well at night knowing that Thurgood Marshall was on the Supreme Court. So when Thurgood Marshall retired and uh, Justice Thomas was proposed, I distinctly remember a conversation with a friend of mine who was very concerned about Justice Thomas's likely approach to the law once he was on the court. And I remember feeling at that time that it's just that I can't handle the idea of a Supreme Court of the United States without a Black person on it. It was too many centuries of that. And so I was kind of like, I will live with that, the nominee, you know, and there was all the, the stuff about his confirmation, and I'm not getting into that part, but I, what, you know, that there was at least a Black person on the court was, it was too much for me to have a court that didn't have any Black people on it. So now today, there's going to be a court that's going to have two Black people on it, something that my mother couldn't have imagined, something that really I never imagined. And it's wonderful. And so part of what's fun with that is now I feel that I can really criticize Justice Thomas because he's not the only one anymore, you know? And I can go at him for all the nonsense in particular, uh, I mean, I criticized him on things along the way, but uh, I think this, this, there's a kind of beauty in this moment where you have Justice Thomas coming up and catching all this heck about his wife's work to overthrow the election and, he, and his 8-1 decision on the release of the documents when he would have known about that. I thought that is, there's a kind of, having her come in to, to be a part of the Supreme Court, I'm gonna love to imagine the discussions about recusal and all that, that will be had. And if he tries to play a race card, she's like, nah, brother, nah, brother. No, 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 Not no, working. no. Not working, brother, not working. She said that she planned to recuse herself for the things related to her, you know? She's That's already a, in there. She's you know? already recognizing what the role of a judge really is in terms of making decisions. She's already got that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She's got it. Because that's that's she sits on the board there. So she obviously knows this is not something that I should be a part of. But I want to take away from her moment with him. Yeah, fine. <laughs> You know, because this, I mean, I, I got up early to watch uh, when I heard that it was, they were going to do the vote. I generally don't watch Senate, uh, comp, you know, those hearings on C-SPAN. But this one, I just felt compelled to just, well, for us, it was early, uh, get up early and, and, and watch this. And I was struck by how emotionally it hit me. Yeah. It, I was sitting there thinking, oh, this is like, woo, I'm waiting for this rah-rah feeling to come. And it was solemn. Yes. 
it was so solemn. I sat there and I was like, this is a moment to just sit and relish as a, as a, as a black woman, as a retired judge myself, to just sit there and relish in that moment and feel for her and be for her. It struck me in a way that I had just not expected. Mm. Um, mm. You know, I, had, I even have my black woman lawyer shirt on today. I was uh, going to be in a cheering mode, but I was just like, this is so solemn. This is yes. so powerful. This is so important. This yes. means so much to so many of us, particularly for, for black women. This just means so much. We are so, when I just say black women, I mean, I really mean black women, lawyers and judges who have just sort of sure. been the, the last group within the profession, if so to speak, you know, in terms of, you know, where we are oftentimes with uh, positions and status and all of that, but sort of like the, the last, even though in, in her instance, her credentials, her credibility, her credentials are unassailable. Right. They're simply unassailable, even though, you know, they tried everything to uh, uh, make it look like she's some crazed person, uh, but she's not. She's, right. she's she's brilliant. She's competent. She's accomplished. She's done all the things that we want judges to do to be able to do. She's represented clients. She's been to court. She's tried cases in the in the district court in the appeals court. She's done everything. She's seen it all. She's experienced it all. She's felt it on all those levels in a way that so many of some of the others have not. They've not nope. even had that wealth of experience that comes with what she's accomplished. And in that moment, it just hit me like, whoa. <laughs> right. I am so proud and happy for her and for what it does for Black women lawyers, Black women judges, all across, anyway. Yes. Well, I wanted to I wanted to pick up on your comment that uh, having been last, right? And I vaguely remember a line from the Bible that was something along the lines, the last shall be first, all right? And today, every single one of those Black women who have thought of themselves as the last have a little part of feeling that I am first now. And I think that that's kind of a beautiful part of it, you know? The other thing yes. I wanted, I, I wanted to, to say is I have listened for a long time to Republicans referring to themselves as the party of Lincoln. And I just wanted to say, and I wrote this on a Facebook post, if you are the party of Lincoln, you vote for her. And if you aren't the party of Lincoln, then you don't. And so I just looked at the numbers that of numbers of Republicans that voted for, I'd said for the Democrats too, because, you know, but I was like, okay, 53, 47, I think there were three Republicans that voted for yeah, her. Were. And so, and there were 47, including Tim Scott, that voted against her. And so I'm kind of like, okay, folks, you go around and bandy that party of Lincoln thing all the time. But at this crucial moment, with a person who has all of the qualities that you could ever imagine. And I thought that Senator Romney's comment on that in his approval of her was basically, hey, I might not agree with everything she's gonna decide, but she is clearly qualified and got the right kind of integrity to be the person that's there. And if you can't get over yourself and your tricks, then never again, Never again call yourself the party of Lincoln. I don't know what you're the party of, but you are not the party of Lincoln based on that vote today. You know, that's how strongly I felt that, you know. Yeah. Well, that party of Lincoln, that party of Lincoln ended in what, 64? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I know, but I, you know. It's so called the Republican it. Party. That thing switched up in, in uh, 64, is it 64 or whenever? Well, I forget. Yeah, when it yeah, was yeah with, with Tell you and all. Or, yeah, yeah, that that's yeah. when that ended. I mean, I you know, I know of you know a lot of older you know blacks who would refer to being Republican. Uh, yeah, 
in those my times because a- it was because that was what Lincoln. Of course, I right. grew up in Chicago, so we don't have such things. But <laughs> so, uh, my- at least in my time, there were no such things, regardless. Yeah, no, my mother was a Republican. <laughs> I you know grew up in the in the uh, original daily era so yeah yeah, oh. <laughs> yeah the daily machine and all that yeah yeah but, that you know, was... but, you know, my, I want to say my mother was a Republican and switched along the way I don't know which one it was sixty four maybe it was sixty with uh, it might have been sixty it, it might yeah. I think sixty when Kennedy came in a lot of those yeah. folks switched and then you had this whole Southern strategy thing that came out of uh with the Democrats and the voting. Anyway, that's another story. Yeah. But today is uh, Judge Jackson's day. Yeah, it really is. And I, I hope she is have, you know, just so, so happy. And because so many people, not only in the United States, but I would say around the world, are happy that she is on the Supreme Court. I bet you all over Africa, there are people saying, well, look at that, African lawyers, lawyers out in Asia, in Europe, in Southern, South America, saying, look at this. This is not just an American moment. It is a world moment of, yeah. that uh, we should all be enjoying rather than falling down into some kind of, you know, partisanship thing again, you know, but it's, it's magical. It's magic. And yeah. What did you think, Chuck? You were, you've been watching this too. So I think a couple of things that as badly as some of the senators behaved, interrupting, insulting, falsely accusing, things like that, there were a couple of highlight moments. One of them pictorially captured, and it's gone viral, the picture of her daughter looking on as her mom withstood those attacks with class and grace and dignity. And and after those attacks, Cory Booker stepping up saying, they're not going to take away our joy. Mm. Yeah. This is our time. We've earned it. We're there. We're going to finish this process. So what of her special knowledge and experience does she bring now that are especially important in these times and going forward? I know we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. I, I, ben, if you got some thoughts on this, I, I you know, having, you know, having um, been on the bench, not at the level that she is clearly, but you know, having tried cases, particularly on the, from a criminal stand on the criminal bench, and having had to really understand what it takes to be in that space, to be in that place of having to make these kinds of decisions um, about people. I mean, I'm not getting away from just like, you know, discussing esoteric legal issues, but that understanding that there's a person in front of you who is, there's a person, there's a real live person in front of you. for whom you have to make a decision, for whom you have to address whatever it is they may have done or whatever decision you made to make about the case, if they're real live people. And I think what she brings, having had all of those experiences, both as a public defender, um, as a family member in law enforcement, knowing the impacts of that, having had a family member, you know, outside of the law and just having grown up as a black woman in America, through all that that entails, I think she brings um, a perspective to the bench that is needed. That's not to say that just being a you know black female or is you know I say call it a get out of jail free card. That's not it. It's a perspective that you bring, a way in which you, a lens through which you can see things in a different way than someone who's not had any of those experiences uh, can do. I mean, you, you, that's just, I mean, I think that's the importance and the necessity of diversity itself, is that it brings a different perspective, a different set of experiences 
through which you can see the lens of how you're making decisions. And I'll just share one little incident. I recall, um, I was having to look at, at my stuff today and I was like recalling, I was walking down the street one day, this is like years after I, you know, and this woman, very, very well-dressed woman, a black woman, smiled and spoke and of course you know why we don't have that many so we always say hi <laughs> you speak and she stopped to to ex you know exchange and she told me that i had sentenced her son to prison mm. and when she told me her son's name i remembered him well i had sentenced him to, to prison it was for 20 years it was a very serious charge uh, and it had uh, was quite serious. And I remembered his family being in the audience uh, as he was sentenced. And I remember having gone through the pre-sentence report that we had that detailed his life experience, his family. You know, he'd come from this was, you know, a regular what I would in, in my experience, a, you know, a, a typical kind of middle class black family. He had been given these values and grew up not, you know, he he had people supporting him. He had been given a set of values by his family and he he just clearly deviated from that. And I knew that because I know a lot of people like that. Mm -hmm. So I remember saying to him for this particular experience that he was involved in, which was, you know, really off the mark. And I said, this is, this is not you. This is not how you were raised. And he said to me, no, it's not. It isn't. I, and I, and it's like, I could see him. I saw him. I saw this kid growing up in this family and having all these experiences and then just, you know, taking a left turn. But I think because I knew people like that, I knew of that life experience that you could do that in this country as a, as a, you know, as a, as a, as a black kid growing up and just have that happen. I understood that. And I told her that, and I told him that I said, this is not you. So, you know, you got to take responsibility for what you did, but I know this is not you. Your family knows this is not you make that change. When you come out, you got to, you know, you got to pull yourself back together and not, and you have the ability to do so. Yeah. I had that experience. I knew that. And she yeah. told me that she reminded me that that's, she remembered what I said to him. Now, if I didn't have that kind if, you know, I'm not saying another person who's not black wouldn't understand it, but I think my ability to having had that life experience enabled me to be able to see that, to see that he's just not some, you know, crawling out from under a rock somewhere doing something crazy that that's not him. I knew that. And I saw that a lot. I saw that a lot um, in the, in the, un unfortunately, I saw it more often than you can imagine. Mm -hmm. um, then you can, you know, the day in which is a woman who's asking for continuance for her uh, son's case so she could go attend the college graduation of the other son. <sighs> what? <sighs> yes, you can go to the graduation. We can postpone that sentencing. <sighs> This is what families deal with. This is what people deal with. And she understood, and she's had, she brings it. I'm sorry, go ahead, Ben. She brings some yeah. of that to the table and you can understand these are real people. They're real people with real life experiences. Yeah. Yeah, I was yeah. gonna say that uh, because of the holes in the resumes of the other eight justices, in terms of their experiences, I expect that they have myths that they believe about each of those levels and each of those kinds of experiences that they've been living on or inculcated along the way. And what she brings is actual experience in each of those areas actual. that they cannot counter with some myth. You know, mm -hmm. they cannot deny she has that experience. They can fight about it and disagree with it but they can't just kind of blow some smoke, so to speak. And I've read some of these opinions of justices uh, or even listen, uh, read some of the transcripts of oral arguments where I've been quite honestly appalled by the cavalierness of some of them, which suggested to me they really don't have that kind of gravitas 
outside of the legal rules yes. that she's going to bring. Yes, absolutely. You know, and and uh, and and uh, you know, I'm I'm just that's where I'm hopeful. In a way, it reminds me of a comment I think Justice Sandra Day O'Connor talked about when uh, Thurgood Marshall, Justice Thurgood Marshall, passed away. Is they'd be in their meetings with the nine justices. And, you know, somebody would say, well, you know, that $10 fee is no big deal for somebody to, I don't know, get their registration for something. And Thurgood Marshall would talk about $10, what it would mean and the cases he'd had to deal with, you know, where somebody was thinking 25 cents was a huge thing. You know what I mean? And that kind of, you know, yeah. the, 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 the other justices could not say anything against it. They, they can play around with it, but they know he had the background experience to be able to say those things uh, and hopefully influence them in some way in the manner in which they approached whatever the case was in front of them. That's what I think that no, she brings. Yeah, absolutely. And, it's, and that goes to the chief justice and the other seven justices on there. They, they have holes in their resumes. I, I, I'm not saying they don't have great resumes, okay? I'm not, but they have holes in their resumes that she does not have. And that's the thing that she brings that will help them to be better justices, I think. Yeah, I think, I agree. I think so too. And, and I, I think because she's not, uh, her experiences have not isolated her from real life. Uh, and I think sometimes, when you look at you know some of the other, as you say, <laughs> holes in the re resumes, there has been this sort of isolation, you know, within the silos of, you know, uh, legal dissertation sometimes that yeah. shelters you from the fact that real people are standing in front of you with real life experiences, and they're here because you've got to make a decision that's going to impact the way they live their life. Yeah. It, 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 it's it's real life. I mean, I, I, I remember I used to tell my staff, you know, this is criminal court. Everybody who's coming in here is, <laughs> you know, this is what we do for, we do this. But everybody is traumatized. Folks stayed up all night trying to figure out what they were going to do, how they were going to respond, whether they were jurors, whether they were defendants, whether they were witnesses. People walking through these doors are traumatized by this whole experience of mm -hmm. being in court, particularly yeah. in a criminal setting. And you can't, and I think she certainly gets that. Yeah. You yeah. got to get it. Um, yeah. Anyway, and that's, that's just a really valuable, sense. valuable insight because it, it connects with her, her other related experience, not once but twice, as a very influential member of the Federal Sentencing Commission. Yes, that too. And yes, exactly. One who was able, in a very divided bipartisan commission, to bring about virtual unanimity on how broken that system was mm -hmm. and how much in need of change it was. Yeah. And one of the things that came out in the hearings was that her sentences were commensurate of with course. those of other federal judges. Of course. Oh, yeah. It was the guidelines that were broken, not the judges. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Just yeah. like when the questions are posed about stacking the court and packing the court, that's not her call, that's Congress's call. Yeah, yeah. If they decide to increase, that's not on her. That's not on judges anyway. As it was as though they sort of forgotten what it is that uh, you know the different branches of government do. Well, for yeah, I want to jump on a uh, you know on that particular point too with regards to the questioning that's there. I would like to hope that in the elections that come up this fall, there would be people who would have listened to the questions that were there, that were said to her, and would recognize that there was something fundamentally wrong with the questioner. That means that they need to leave the Senate. They don't get it, okay? They don't and even I don't know, know who's yet. running against any of them, but I'm gonna say, for example, the whole definition of a woman one, was for me 
uh, appalling. And by the way, I've seen there have been efforts by these some of these senators to define what a woman is. And one of the conclusions that one of them's uh, definition was that a woman who had a hysterectomy was not a woman. That makes no sense. You know what I'm saying? You know, it makes no sense. Uh, uh, the second uh, uh, thing, and I think it's important that no, 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 people, no, no. people say, I mean, I can understand ideological differences. I can understand, you know, theories or all that kind of stuff. But the kind of what I could only call Sheep shots, one of them that I would like to say, and she handled with such grace that I'm still amazed by, was when there was a senator who asked her what her religion was as the first question. When we all know the Constitution has no religious test for any office, whether state or federal. And so it is so out of bounds under the Constitution to ask somebody about something that they may be public about, they may be private about, but you don't ask it. Exactly. And she handled it with grace and, you know, answered. But I thought of what if somebody was not Protestant, non-denominational, but what if somebody was Jewish back in the day? There was the whole thing with, I think it was Justice Brandeis when these, when these hearings started. Or what if somebody was Muslim or, or Hindi or something like that? Something that was quote unquote not sort of our, you know, American Protestant space, right? I I I felt for any candidate who would ever be in that spot, who had done all the kinds of remarkable things, and would have to be confronted with something that is clearly not constitutional. Yeah. yeah. It, it it you know, and she handled it with grace. She did. But, um, you know, but I say think about that when you're looking at the election this fall. I think so. It, think about that if you're a person in the in the district or in the state where one of these people is up. Is this really the kind of person you want to represent you? And I, and I, I push that. And I'm not saying that you have to pick, you know, uh, a Democrat, if it's a Republican I'm talking about. I'm just saying that if there's a primary, look at, is this person the one I want or is it another? Republican or another Democrat that I want to be the one who represents me because it's it's appalling. I mean, to me, it it was it was it was uh, it was so beneath their role, if I could say it like that. Yeah. And but she's confirmed, and yes. for that we can. That's a great so way for us to we, finish up today. We can rejoice. She is confirmed. And she will go on to be, oh, man, I, I, okay, I'm getting Gone. excited now. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking for a first question and a first hearing in the fall. I'll come, if I, at, at some oral argument in October, just, okay, what did she say? What was her first question? You know, I'm just waiting for that. That's it. Sandra, Ben, thank you so much for another great, lively, candid session. And may we all hope that the invaluable, diverse human experience mm -hmm. and the wonderful bipartisan communication ability that Justice Jackson brings to the table will help us see better choices. We all can, we all can hope. I like yeah. that, Justice Jackson. <laughs> Justice Jackson, there we go. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> Thank you all. Come back and see us in a couple of weeks. We will be back. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs>
Mahalo.